Welcome back guys. We're doing a little uh, 2D adaptive right here. There are lots of different tool paths, lots of different cutter styles, and I want to just cover a little bit of that uh, clip to clip in this video for you guys. So this is a YG three flute end mill that we use for a lot of our 2D adaptives and 3D adaptives. You use the edge of this end mill, or generally speaking, more often than not, we focus or try to cut more often than not with only the edge of this end mill. Very deep cut with a very low radial engagement, that would be considered high efficiency milling. Now, the opposite of that is a very wide cut, but a very shallow cut, and that would be high feed milling. And this is a little die jet cutter, and I absolutely adore this tool. You can see that there's one installed in the long arbor. We have the medium arbor. And now this is the another die jet on the short arbor. And the X7 has such fast rapids and it's it basically has enough rigidity and speed that it really makes feed milling really useful. And so I use this cutter a lot in uh, tool steel. We cut a lot of P20 tool steel here. And it's really cost effective too because it's got three inserts and each, each insert has two cutting edges. And some feed mills even have more. This is my Kyocera uh, Mini Raptor or Micro Raptor. I can't remember. I think this is a Mini Raptor, and it's uh, it's a feed mill that I bought for the Super Mini Mill that we once had. And what's nice is this doesn't put a lot of lateral load on the spindle. It forces the it puts the cutting forces up vertically through the axis of the tool. I've got this little uh, digital microscope I bought off Amazon for like 99 bucks, and I would encourage you to get one if you're going to do a lot of cutting, especially if you have inserted tools or if you want to to be able to evaluate your tools. You can see we've got a little chip scarring on this die jet. But a lot of times people ask always, a lot of people ask, you know, which tool path should I use? And there are just so many factors. Are you trying to maximize material removal rates? Do you have reach issues, in which case you need to use something like this die jet? Do you have, does your machine have a lot of spindle torque? Does it have a lot of rigidity? There, there are just there are so many factors that compete uh, for your ability to make good decisions that it's, it's it can be a real challenge. So I'm a big fan of the die jet mill. I use it a lot. In fact, we use it here in this video shortly to cut a mold base. And so I'll show you that in just a few minutes. Right now, this is actually a finishing. This is a 2D contour tool path that we're actually using to finish the bottom side of our vice fixture. And the reason I didn't do this all in one pass is because there wasn't enough flute on the end mill to take the entire depth of cut. So uh, it's cutting about, I want to say about 600 thousandths deep, and then we're going to go all the way to the bottom and we're going to make this final pass. And you can see it's nice and clean. From here, I believe we're going to lead into a little bit of actually adaptive roughing. So we'll, we'll let this finish up and then we'll talk about that when we get there. All right, here we go. This is actually a 2D adaptive roughing. You can see we're using almost the entire flute of the end mill. This is a 900,000 steep cut. And I ended up using about 8,000 RPMs. Uh, I believe this is about 3,000 inch per tooth and about 60,000 step over. So it's about a little, little less than 20% step over. And this is a live, this is live time. This is a real time. You can see I turned the rapids all the way up and it's super fast. When you have the ability to take a cut like this, a lot of times a solid carbide tool is ideal. And you want to match your tool to your material. So these solid carbide tools tend to be really sharp for aluminum and they're really polished for good chip evacuation. You can see that we're taking these cuts with absolutely no coolant whatsoever here in the moment and it's doing okay. But if you try to do this with a tool that wasn't designed for this, you could very easily weld a chip into that tool if you don't have your feet and speed just absolutely flawless.
you can hear it squeals a little bit as it starts to get a little bit thinner. All right, now we have the feed mill and you can hear we're working in the X7 right up near the travel limits. We're very, very close to the travel limits in X and not quite as close in Y. Actually, I take that back. I think we're actually very close in both in X and in Y. And you can hear that when this thing gets, when it plunges down, it's actually nipping the material. That's because we're so close to the limits that there's really nothing I could do. And I played around with the feeds and speeds and you can hear when it's in the cut, it's actually really clean. But when it, right when it enters, it kind of nips it a little bit. And this just, it probably could have been avoided if I wanted to do a tremendous amount, uh, a tremendous amount of additional setup or maybe uh, break this up into more operations, but this worked really well. I just ended up slotting that right hand side and then I was able to just break that off later on when it was done. So this magnetic chuck has ac actually worked out really, really good, but these are just a couple of different applications that show you where you might want to choose a specific cutter style or for uh, a specific uh, tool path more than anything. So there are so many ways to skin a cat. There isn't just one way to accomplish something. And a lot of times it's learning what your machine will tolerate or or what you have access to. So hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it and we'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.